Right, let's put these hives out. We should put this one in. Uh, put that one at the end. So we're putting these hives here because it's close to the barn. And they're close to the barn because that's where the cats live. Yeah. And the idea of having the beehives close to cats is that the cats will scare away the field mice. And the field mice raid the beehives. They raid them and they eat the young bees and everything else. If we're close to the, the cats, the cats will chase them away and, and hence the bees will be safe. That's the theory. That's the theory. So the first set of hives next to the barn should be untouched. We're going to put a second set of bumblebee hives in a field as far away from the cats as possible. Got that? You put that over there on that side. In the mine. middle or yeah, the I'll end? Put, we'll put it in the middle. I'll put mine at the end. Okay, okay. This is the second site, and we're going to put these out exactly the same way as we've done the others. Okay. The only difference here, no cats. So these beehives should be attacked by the mice. But it's not as simple as that. I mean, you've got foxes here, you've got owls, all lots of other predators, stoats and weasels. Yes. Um, so we'll see. But the main difference between this site and, and the other site is the fact that there's an absence of cats. Our whole experiment depends on a field mouse willingly entering a hive of bumblebees. To check this out, we caught one and tempted it with a bumblebee nest to see what would happen. I assumed the field mouse would be too scared of being stung, yet the greedy fellow still went for it. So, it's clear our experiment might just work. Right, time to check out the bumblebee hives. These ones are near the cats. Now what I'm looking for is any predation by, by mice. So. Let's have a look at the first hive. There's a couple of bees poking their heads out. No signs of mice. You'd expect some droppings or someone that's chewed around the, the wooden parts of the, the hive. Oh, yeah, very active. You can hear that rumbling. But I've just disturbed them. Right, number two. OK, there's bees in here. But again, there's not much activity of mice at all, though. Definitely expect some droppings or something. Right, this one here. Oh yeah, plenty of bees, look at that. <laughs> so it looks like they're either very lazy mice or the cats have done their job here. Now over to the field far from the barn. I doubt the cats have been up here. Now this bee just flew out. Yeah. OK. Busy little hive. Not as many bees as uh, down by the uh, farm. But it's still there. Now, this is interesting. Now, here, there's nice and clean. The bees have been very busy cleaning their hives. There's no debris. Here, there's lots of debris. There's not a lot of activity. Ba -bum. Empty hive. It's completely dead. Completely dead. What about, oh, this one's active. Yep. OK, healthy hive again. Not masses of bees, but um, still bees there. This one completely dead. So, has a mouse done this or not? There's all this debris here and these tall weeds, so it just looks like a derelict house. And it's even. Looks like dried mouse droppings here. And unfortunately for these guys, it was the end of the road. The results are in. Out in the field, 
one hive has failed. Yet over by the barn, all three hives are thriving. Of course, I can't claim much from such a small-scale experiment, but it looks to me as if Darwin might have been right with his prediction. The number of cats does seem to influence the success of bumblebees, and therefore the amount of red clover. Who'd have thought it? As Darwin put it, how complex and unexpected are the checks and relations between organic beings which have to struggle together. Darwin's experiments have built up powerful evidence for his theory of evolution. But he is well aware of a weakness at the heart of all his research. The ability of seeds to travel the world, the diversity of life, the struggle for existence, the evolution of new species. The weakness of Darwin's theory is the length of time it all takes. He knows that the wheels of evolution turn very slowly. Without enough time, without millions upon millions of years, evolution simply could not have happened. Darwin has to establish the true age of the Earth. By good fortune, his house is perched on the edge of the South Downs. It sits on the geological clue that might help save his theory. By the 19th century, geologists have mapped out the rock formations of Britain. They have discovered that the North and South Downs are actually the remains of an ancient chalk mountain nearly 50 miles across. Darwin's masterstroke is to try to calculate how many years it took for this huge mountain of chalk to erode and leave the gentle rolling countryside of the Downs we see today. If Darwin can work this out, it will give him the age of this part of Britain. Oh, it sort of squeezes you all in the wrong places. <laughs> To help him figure out the rate of erosion, Darwin takes an interest in coastal cliffs. That's why I'm here, with a dozen coast guards and Rory Mortimer, Professor of Geology at Brighton University. We've got 50 metres of cliff here, something like that, 50 metres, and we're going to go down through a little time elevator, looking right. at the layers as we go. So it's like a time machine? Yeah, fantastic. OK, it's not the first time you've done it. No, first time for you. First time for me. A little bit nervous. The pigs will miss you. They will. <laughs> Hang on. There's your... In Darwin's day, estimates of the Earth's age differ wildly. Based on a literal reading of the Bible, some theologians plump for just 6,000 years old. Darwin knows this is way too recent. He and most Victorian geologists suspect the Earth is much older, but there are few hard figures. This doesn't deter Darwin. So, Rory, I, I mean, I was really surprised to find out that, that Darwin's first and foremost love was actually geology, not biology. He was a very good geologist, and in fact he came to cliffs like these to understand time, geological time. But, you know, 20, 20, 30 feet down a cliff, what does that really represent? Well, this represents here, as far as we've come, perhaps 100,000 100, years of cliff. You see, we've got these wonderful flint bands going as horizontal layers across the cliff. Each flint band representing perhaps 20,000 years of Earth's history. So there's a lot of time locked into these cliffs. 